One of the most prevalent natural disasters in Nigeria is flooding, which threatens the sustainability of health, social life, and environment. Just as the dry season comes between November and March, the rainy season is heavy between April and October. In 2022 alone, data from the United Nations Children's Fund say the floods affected 34 out of the 36 states in the country, killing more than 600 persons and leaving 1.3 million persons displaced. Cases of diarrhea, waterborne diseases and skin diseases have also been on the rise. Now, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency and National Emergency Management Agency have issued an alert about the potential threat of flooding in certain regions of the country. They advise residents to take necessary measures to prevent loss of life and property. But experts have said early warning signals is not enough, as there needs to be more precautionary measures taken from or by the government. Joining us in the studio is the Director of Programs Corporate Accountability and Public Participation, Africa, Philip Jackbo. Good morning. Thank Good you for morning. joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, from 20, I think that was 2000 and, uh, 2021 or earlier than that, that we had that serious flooding. That was 2012. 2012, yeah. And it's like 11 years afterwards. We are still talking about this issue because we recall how some communities in some states were drenched or drowned by this flooding. And just last year, we saw how the floods also swept some communities' farmlands. In fact, a lot of persons were concerned that uh, food security was going to be a challenge for Nigeria. Yeah. The question is, are we really learning lessons to addressing this matter? Why is it so difficult for us to address this issue head on? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I think in the last three or four years, we've been discussing the same issue okay. um, because uh, like you rightly noted, um, since 2012, we've had you know, the worst cases of flooding. Um, 2012, I think about uh, 21 states mm -hmm. were underwater. Uh, the government at the time set up a committee to look at what to do. Um, Two or three years after, we didn't hear anything. Now, last year, again, like you rightly noted, I think about 1.4 million people were displaced, mm. about um, 700 billion in terms of agricultural losses were incurred. You know, livestock were lost, hectares of land underwater. Here we are again. I must commend the NIMET. Um, and the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agencies, they've been doing a lot in terms of early warnings since 2012. There's no problem at that end. I think the, where we have the big challenge is the fact that the states are doing nothing to address this crisis that we're having year in, year out. How do you mean? Now, the, the warnings are not just warnings for warning's sake. The warnings are to get states to take some concrete actions. What are some of the things they can do, for instance? Uh, they are to um, also warn their you know, uh, citizens of those, those states. And they are supposed to target particularly the riverine areas, Uye and of course the floodplains that are supposed to take in these floodwaters. And then loss of lives have occurred you know, year in, year out. We are supposed to, at this point, be hearing the states, for instance, talking about uh, shelters on high ground for residents of riverine communities. Now, note that because of our peculiar situation, um, state governments have done little to accommodate the poor in the society. I don't think anybody wants to live along the river banks, except maybe the jaw the uh, Shekiri, the Elagez, who thrive you know, along that axis. But even at that, we can make plans for them to relocate because it has become seasonal. Mm. So that we don't have the kind of loss of lives we had you know, like previous years. 
The number of people dying has continued to grow. Last year, it's about, it was about 1,000 people. Like I said, about 1.4 million displaced. displaced. There was a community in Bayelsa where mm -hmm. even the graves were unhurted. Mm -hmm. So the cops and human beings were struggling for space, mm -hmm. you know, in floodwaters. You could imagine what these things are going to cost. Now we are talking about you know, the, the economic challenges Nigerians are passing through. And when you have flooding of farmlands, this is going to complicate the whole thing. So the states are not responding. That is where the problem do is. Do they have the capacity? They do have the capacity to respond. We had some semblance of response during the COVID-19 pandemic. They set up centers. Why can't we have those kind of centers for people who live in the riverine area. Recall that gave them, government gave them some funds at the time to set up some of the centers. Well, the states, the states have their own internally generated revenue. They can do these things. It's, it's not rocket science. And then when we, we talk of this relocation, it's not that. Because every time you hear, they are telling people, relocate. Relocate where? That's the question. That's what the people are saying. That's what people relocate are saying. where? But this gap that we are seeing now, how can we give government the needed push or, or where do you see us going you know in this regard because this has become an annual uh, cycle and the rains are here already already we are even you know hearing reports of losses losses of, 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 of lives of course of course and, and all now can you do more than what we are doing now government people they are listening to us nema sema and the, of course the, the synergy between the national emergency management agency and the, that of the state level is also something that is worth looking into because even at that level, because last year a lot of people were cut off. No speedboats could get to them. Yes. No choppers, like what we see abroad. Yeah. So at this point, even Nema should be telling us that, oh, for this year, we have secured about 10 choppers, um, maybe 20 speedboats to reach people who are going to be cut off. Those are the kind of things we want to hear. It's not just this alarm every year and then you, you have situations whereby some people are cashing on that. In 2012, when the floods happened in Lokoja, mm. I was in Lokoja, one of the ID, IDP camps. A, 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 a government official came to that, um, uh, one of the, the, the camps, brought food stuffs. A lot of pictures were taken. And before you knew it, it was, it was going back with those same food stores. So it has become something that some people... So there's corruption. Yes, there's corruption around this thing. Some people are making money from this thing. So the, rather than address the issues, they would rather want to jump in when people have been displaced so that bags of rice, bags of gari, and things like that are located and divert it. Mm. So I think this administration should be serious at, uh, this time around. It's a new administration, so the thinking should be different. But then you can look at the, the states that were mentioned. They are within the region where you have uh, floods ultimately coming from the Lagdo Dam mm. in Cameroon. I'm happy that I heard something, um, I've not read in detail, that the Senate or so is talking about finally building Dams. the Dassin House Dam since 1979. When the Lagdo Dam in Cameroon was built, Nigeria was supposed to build a buffer dam. dam. Yes, down, down because we are we are downstream, yeah. so that when waters are released from that end, we can assimilate it. Yes. Since 1979, this is 2023. This is when we are talking about doing something. So, I and I always say this, and it's worth saying. Mm. See, if we are at war with Cameroon, they don't need to shoot anyone. All they need to do is release waters from Lagdo Dam. Are we not thinking as a people, even this flooding is a security issue. Right. It's a security issue. If they release waters, they can flood half of Nigeria. Mm. So some people are not thinking. They're only thinking of maybe what they can make from this thing. So we should be proactive. Even this um, Senate's position, is it a low-hanging fruit, so to speak, with construction of dams? It's going to take time. Right. But at least we have heard it, so we can hold them to account. The Senate said it. What have they done? So Nigerians can hold on to this. But beyond that, the states, like I said, have to be very, very responsible. But now they should be opening the dams. They should be opening the drainages. They should be sensitizing people in, the, in those communities. They should build um, 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 uh, 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 shelters on high ground. These, these things are not too much. 
Mm. They should not wait and start talking about ecological funds for little things that they can do. That is where the problem is. Now, there, there are those who are saying, talking about um, dredging, for, for instance, and I'm wondering how much that will do to addressing or mitigating this flooding that we are talking about. Well, I, I'm not an expert. Um, we've heard that the, the dredging is one of the ways to go. Um, environmentalists have also said that also has its own challenge. But now we must go beyond talk because I think some monies have also been voted for the dredging. You know what has happened? <coughs> Nothing has happened. So this is a, is a security issue, mm. and it should be taken. How is it that we are not seeing it as such? Is it because we do not have an understanding of uh, the matters of climate change and its impact? Well, if some people want to benefit from these things, corruption is corruption is a sin. It, it beclouds you. So when some people feel they can use this to make money, they don't see the bigger picture. When this thing happens, it's going to affect them too. We've had floods that cut off, you know, like I was in Lukoja, like I mentioned. I had to leave Lukoja because we're not talking about the remote area. We're talking about the capital. Yes. And it was that bad. Vehicles coming from Abuja had to wait for the flood to, to subside. Yes. And that took like one week. Some people slept on the road for, 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 for days. Mm. So the, the implication ultimately is bigger than those little things they want to make. So um, I expect this administration to take this serious the issue of the building of those buffer dams. And they are smaller dams mm. because huge dams also constitute a problem once there's a breach. Mm. Yeah, once, once you have a... Environmentally, it is not sound to build big dams anymore. Really? Any breach, we are going to be underwater. So there are smaller dams, but the most important thing is that they assimilate the waters. And so by the time it get, waters get to these communities, they are not as much as will have come that way. Ultimately, those waters coming will sneak their way and empty into the Atlantic. So while states have been mentioned, there are states down even here in the south that are also going to have these floods, mm -hmm. not because of where it is happening, that is happening there, but it's happening up north. It's coming down, Bayesa, for, for instance, and it's going to be underwater. And of um, Oyon Dam. Yeah, in Lagos, yeah, uh, uh, Dion, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the um, Akute Axis. Ogun. Ogun, when the dam is... So it's going to affect all of us, one way or the other. But are we exploring the use, are we utilizing the potential of maybe scientific solutions to curbing um, this um, issue of uh, recurring floods? Well, I, th I think this is not rocket science. We all, we have been talking about it since 2012. Mm. You know, climate change, of course, has different impacts. In some parts of the world, it's excessive snow. In some parts of the world, it's heat. In our own uh, part of the world, in Nigeria particularly, you have rising sea level. Go to Legush in, in the, 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 the Lekki Axis. Those communities, with time, they are going under. Mm. Because you have serious coastal erosion happening. That's why it's sand filling. The sand filling is just cosmetic. Because Ultimately, it's, it's going. You can't, you can't fight water. Right. Mm. Because, because the argument for some people, observers, is that some countries, you know, are also like, you know, 70% or majority of some countries are also, you know, water. Is, is it Norway or so that they said was even built largely on water? So why should Nigeria's case be different? Well, that's the question we need to ask, because what we always do is these early warning systems, which are very effective, I must confess. But those Norway and uh, the countries you are talking about, what they do is they, they have systems to adapt to, because it's seasonal. Yeah. So what are we doing to adapt? In the U.S., and, and most, parts of the, the, uh, yeah, most parts of the U.S., you have the hurricane season, yeah. which brings you know, a lot of flooding. We don't hear of people dying in the thousands. Why? What are they doing? Some of Response. these things we've mentioned, the early, the early warnings, you have coastal guards there everywhere ensuring that people leave. And they don't just tell people to leave. They put in place, even hotels have arrangements in those places mm. where people are accommodated for the period of the... And there are, there are choppers going up and down. People who are on their roofs, they are picked. Here, it's just, uh, just the warning. Mm. What does NEMA and their state counterparts, STEMA, what do they have to reach people who are going to be displaced? It's not there. But this matter of ecological funds that you mentioned mm. earlier, there's been talks about how judiciously we have uh, used these funds to addressing these matters. 
See, I, I think the ecological funds can handle the bigger things. When you, maybe the dams, those kind of things. But not these things that these states are talking about. They can handle the Why issues. not? The states have the capacity to build a, a, a shelter on high ground. What will it take? It takes nothing. These states can do it. All but they the don't states? just, yeah, all the states can do it. During COVID, it happened. Centers were set up everywhere because everybody felt all of us are going to die. So everybody was uh, <laughs> running kitty, kitty, kitty to make sure that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, nobody wants to associate with anybody that has uh, COVID. So these shelters sprang up everywhere. But they got federal government support at the time. Well, COVID was new. Nobody knew the ramifications. Yeah. But do the states need those kind of resources to put up just shelters? Some individuals can even do it, mm. but it is a state and federal government responsibility. The state should take their responsibility serious. And Last year, sorry, right. you said, uh, all the way from the United States, you said, started distributing um, uh, 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 first aid kits. Yeah. You know, first aid kits? You mean states cannot do those things? We have to wait for you said? These things are shameful. Mm. These things are shameful. So... I think we have, like you said, a low-hanging fruit with the fact that the Senate has said something. I think um, uh, that discussion was two or so days ago. Mm -hmm. Now we want to hold them to task. Is the uh, 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 Dasin Hausa Dam now going to be expedited? Are we going to have more buffer dams? Let's hear what they have to do with you know, this uh, warning that... Uh, uh, the other you know. dams that we have uh, have functional at day at a critical time like this. No, they are functional also. One well, the issue is that once you have the the rains and they are excessive, you just have to release waters, mm. or else once those, those dams breach, the catastrophe is going to be worse than what you are saying. So it is this release of waters which is what should happen, mm. because if you don't, if there's a breach, it's just like what happened in Ukraine when the uh, the dam in what city was either bombed or, you know, look at what happened. P disaster. Well, then, people yeah. were on the houses, were under water. People were on their rooftops. So that is what a typical dam, a big dam will do. But a small dam, the disaster can be easily mitigated. What are your thoughts on, you know, the floods in Abuja, for example? And I'm not singling out Abuja because many states are also being, being threatened. But uh, looking at, you know, you know ex estates now, in the, especially the Tradmore estate, which yeah. has been in the news um, over the time, there's, it has now pitted the people against the government. Government is saying relocate. The people mm. are saying the fault came from you. Because uh, he gave us the land. He, yeah. he gave us the land, the issue of control, you know, government giving a permit, so to speak, yeah. building permits, so to speak. And that is also being reflected across the country. As in, why would government even allow people to stay on flood plains you know, in, in, in the, in the flood, first place? And now government having to push people out um, that we see now, people saying they won't go. Well, the, the, what, what I, my analysis is this, um, and that I mentioned it earlier. Now, we, when we are planning our towns, when we are planning the cities, town planning should accommodate even the poor. Low-cost housing should be affordable for those we consider the low people in society. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Like I said, I don't think anybody just wants to stay on floodplain, except those who are wealthy. I think those should be sanctioned because some people actually block waterways. Mm. They have lots of money, but they choose to either be at the waterfront for some reasons. Those are the kind of people to be sanctioned. But for the common people who cannot afford it, they are only victims of the system. Mm. That's where they can find accommodation or build something and nobody disturbs them. So for those categories of people, like I said, uh, you know, development should have a human face. And that human face should accommodate the fact that you have the rich in society, you have the poor. We, the minute you continue to push people, you are pushing them to those kind of places, and they then so they are victims. We cannot blame them. We we'll blame the government. All right. Now there are those who are saying uh, perhaps we should have environmental master plan for a holistic solution to addressing not just flooding but environmental issues. Yeah. What do you say to that? Well, I, I think that's a, a good plan. Um, it's, it's it's not too late to do that. Now, that environmental plan, of course, like you hear, for instance, people should relocate. The government should take the lead 
in making these things possible. Yeah. If, for instance, like a, you government decides to relocate, you know, people that live in the riverine areas and they have, you know, uh, shelters on high ground, that's a good step. But it, as you lift more and more people out of poverty, they relocate from those areas. Right. But it is the poverty in the society that is forcing people to such areas. To such areas. So an environmental master plan will ensure that people don't build on floodplains. Permits are not given to people to build on those kind of places. People who, you know, uh, uh, violate the, the laws are sanctioned. You go to Lekki, look at Lekki. Lekki is a mess. Mm. A lot of, I, I, I was in Lekki two days ago. Most of the streets are underwater. So something is wrong. Mm. Most of the streets, you, and then you have a crisis of the magnitude that everybody is trying to, people cannot get into their streets, they cannot get out. And everybody is struggling on, you know, the, the major, major road. So in those places, even if you have a major disaster, nobody will escape. Mm. Everybody will just get into mm. the road and that's where whatever is coming will get us. So the environmental master plan, good. But whatever we must do, we must have human face to accommodate, you know, people who live in these areas who are just victims of the failure of government. Mm. Farmers are particularly threatened by these um, you know, risks that we see. And you've already spoken to how farmlands were washed away and um, you know, billions, billions of naira lost. And now there is a, an advice that farmers should um, embark on at this time, early harvest. Mm. Do, do you subscribe to that? How far will that go? These are just um, uh, hastily taking decisions. Um, early harvest, when it is time to harvest, or early harvest when you are just planting. So these are not measures that are backed with um, reality. Most of what they have planted are not mature yet, and you want them to harvest it. So I think it's a holistic discussion. So, so what are the implications now? Oh, we are looking at we are early have, harvest, we are, we are, and if we do not address these matters mm. holistically. See, it, it's going to have implications on food security. Because we're already complaining that food store, the prices of, like you, your, your last discussion, prices of food stores are going up. So when our farmlands are underwater, it's going to affect not only the farmer who has invested so much and lost almost everything, for do, the little that is able to get out is going to be very, very expensive. Mm. So head or tail, we all lose. That's why we must do the right thing and not be myopic in our thinking. This is the... I, like I said, the flood situation is a security issue. Mm. Security as per security, and it's also a food security issue. Because whatever is going to survive the farmlands will be expensive. So, and when they, they are coming to town, it's going to even be more expensive. Transportation. Transportation, you know, because we don't do a lot of farm gate processing. So the tomatoes, if they're going to get out, some of them are going to be spoiled already because you, are not, you don't have farm gate processing so that we, we convert those ones maybe to tin tomatoes immediately mm -hmm. before the rest come to town. So these are the kind of things. Yams are going to be, okay. cassava, rice. Absolutely. This is, this is really uh, concerning. But uh, in terms of investment, you know, some form of support to the government, to the state government, because I see that your attention is really on, on the states. Uh, is, it, is it a, do you see a terrain? Do you see it as a viable, um, you know, environment for people to come in and support government in? Well, government, um, I don't subscribe to the issue of the state government always running to the federal government for what they can address. Well, if flooding has become something that will now require investment, <laughs> investment, <laughs> I think... A shape or support, the, even the, for the private sector. The state, the private sector will only invest in what they will make money from. Absolutely. Mm. So if the private sector is involved, it could only be because it's going to affect them also. But if we are bringing the private sector to start looking at how to support government in addressing floods. They are not investing in what is not going to be profitable to them. So their investment should be something that is, you know, voluntary. Of course, discussing with government so that they can save their businesses that are also going to be affected. Mm. But if the investment is to partner with government, to they are, they are only interested in making money. So I understand what you mean, 
But we must look at this as a national security issue. The states have their IG. Taking responsibility. They should take responsibility. They should do some little things so that we can say, oh, maybe they want to do something bigger. Now the federal government can come in. Now they can talk about ecological funds. But we have not seen anything that the states are doing to ensure that even their citizens, you know, get Safe. some little comfort from the raging storms. Now, uh, paint us a picture of what you see if we continue in this matter, uh, in, in the way the, and manner we are handling or addressing this matter of flooding uh, in the country. I think the, the climate crisis is escalating globally. Mm -hmm. the, the ice in the polar region is melting, so we're going to have more sea level rise. On those states, I think there's a, the um, ah, there's a, this community in Ondo State, which is practically underwater now. Mm -hmm. I was in that community in 2007, and I think the last report, uh, I think sometime last year, was that that community is gone. So we are going to have more of this kind of thing. So people are going to be displaced. You are going to have people um, uh, migrating, and you know, creating crises. Uh, crisis, population crisis in areas that ideally will not be. So you have more people now moving to Koko. You have more people moving to Ajegunle. You are going to be having this population. kind of... So, but these things are avoidable. You are going to have food crisis. You are, you are, you are also going to have an escalation in crime. Mm. So it has ramification. And a health crisis. Of course, people who are traumatized. I've been to Elegushi. People who hear the, 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 the sound of the Roaring waves of and the they are afraid. Waves. Yeah. Hmm. because they've seen how water swept a lot of their property away. So the minute the water roars, or just like Lekki, once the cloud changes, people start you know, becoming jittery because water will start coming out from their, the walls <laughs> the of walls their homes. Of their houses. <laughs> so it's, Unfortunately. it's going to affect all of us. So we have to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And the state governments, in this case, must take the lead. All right. We, we have to leave this conversation here now. We must thank you. Philip Jabo, uh, Director of Programs, Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa for your time. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's always a pleasure. Right. Thank you.